Hello and welcome to chapter two of Owls in the Family by Farley Moat or Moat. In this book we've already read chapter one and now we're going to be reading chapter two in this video, Owls in the Family by Farley Moat. And if you have not read chapter one with us, I hope you'll go back and do that. A few words that you will want to know as we read chapter two of this book are Indian file. That's when you walk in a line, one behind the other. I would usually say single file, but in this book they say Indian file. And peeved. What does peeved mean? Annoyed. Annoyed or bothered is a word that they use. Peeved is the word they use. And scrounging. Scrounging is when you're looking for something that's kind of hard to find just what you need or want. So like in this picture, that boy is scrounging for a certain piece of wood. He wants to build something and he can't find just the right piece, so he's scrounging around the forest looking for just the right piece of wood to build what he needs to build. So let's read chapter two of Owls in the Family. Chapter two. The reason Dad said, oh no, not owls too, was because I already had some pets. There were, was a summer house in our backyard that we kept about 30 gophers in it. They belonged to Bruce and me, and to another boy called Murray. We caught them out on the prairie using snares made of heavy twine. The way you do it is like this. You walk along until you spot a gopher sitting up beside his hole. Gophers sit straight up, reaching their noses as high as they can so they can see further. When you begin to get too close, they flick their tails, give a little jump, and whisk down their holes. As soon as they do that, you take a piece of twine that has a noose tied on one end, and you spread the noose over the hole. Then you lie down in the grass, holding the other end of the twine in your hand. You can hear the gopher all the while whistling away to himself somewhere underground. He can hear you too, and he's wondering what you're up to. After a while, he gets so curious he can't stand it. He pops his head out and you give a yank on the twine and you have to haul in fast because if the twine gets loose, he'll slip his head out of the noose and zip back down this hole. We had rats too. Murray's dad was a professor at the university and he got some white rats from the medical school. We keep them in our garage. Our gophers and rats Animals that you usually think of being pets? Yes. Who do you know that has a gopher? Nobody. Gophers are not usually pets, just like owls are not usually pets. Sometimes rats, but not very often. Nobody I know has a rat. These are some strange pets they have, which made my dad a little peeved. You think your dad would be a little annoyed if you had rats in your garage? Yes. Definitely. He couldn't put the car in the garage for fear the rats would make nests inside the seats. Nobody ever knew how many rats we had because they have so many babies and they have them so fast. We gave away right, white rats away to all the kids in Saskatoon, but we always seemed to end up with as many as we had at first. They're always having babies so fast. There were rats and gophers, and then there was the big cardboard box full of garter snakes. Garter snakes that we kept under the back porch because my mother wouldn't let me keep them in the house. Then there were the pigeons. <laughs> do you know anyone that keeps pigeons for pets? No. They sometimes in cities people do, but not very often. Not usually on the prairie in Canada. I usually had about ten of them, but they kept bringing their friends and relations for visits, so I never knew how many to expect when I went out to feed them in the mornings. How'd you like to have to feed this many animals in the morning? I don't know. There were some rabbits, too, and then there was Mutt, my dog. But he wasn't a pet. <laughs> so the dog wasn't a pet. He was one of the family. <laughs> Sunday morning, my father said, Billy, I think you have enough pets. 
I don't think you better bring home any owls. In any case, the owls might eat your rats and the rabbits and the gophers. He stopped talking and a queer look came over his face. Then he said, On second thought, maybe we need an owl around this place. Yes. So, First he said it no, was all right. He said yes. Why do you think he changed his answer? He can't. He didn't have much pets. Oh, he has a lot of pets. He has 30 gophers and so many rats, they can't catch them. Can't even count them. There is. What do owls do to gophers and rats? Uh, they eat them. And Dad said you don't want him to eat them, but then Dad said, oh, bring the owl home. Why do you think Dad wants him to bring an owl home? I don't know. Do you think maybe Dad wants the owl to eat the gophers and the rats? No, yes. Seems to me, if, if my little child had a bunch of pet gophers, I would definitely want an owl to come and eat them. <laughs> but that's not what Bruce and the author of the book want to happen, or the narrator want to happen. But that's what the Dad wants to happen. Yeah, I know. Sunday afternoon, Bruce and I met Mr. Miller at his house. He was a big man with a bald head. He wore short pants and carried a great big haversack full of cameras and films. He was excited about the owl's nest, all right. And he was in such a hurry to get to it that Bruce and I had to run most of the way just to keep up with him. When we reached the edge of the owl bluff, Mr. Miller got out his biggest camera and after he fussed with it for about half an hour, he said he was ready. We'll walk Indian file, boys, he said, and quiet as mice, tiptoe, mustn't scare the owl away. Well, that sounded all right. Only you can't walk quietly in a poplar bluff because all of the dead sticks underfoot, they crack and pop like firecrackers. Under Mr. Miller's feet, they sounded like cannon shots. Anyway, when we got to the nest tree, there was no sign of the owl. Are you sure this is an owl's nest? Mr. Miller asked us. Yes, sir, Bruce answered. We seen the owl sitting on it. Mr. Miller shuddered. Saw the owl sitting on it, Bruce. Hmm. Well, I suppose I'd better climb up and take a peek. But if you ask me, I think it's just an old crow's nest. He put down his big haversack in the camera and he went up. He was wearing a big floppy hat to keep his head from getting sunburned. I don't think he could see out from under it very well. Boy, he has got knobby knees, Bruce whispered to me. We both started to giggle, and we were giggling when Mr. Miller began to shout. Hoy! He yelled, Scat! Woo! Hoy! Hoy! What happened to make Mr. <laughs> Miller start making all that noise? And the owl. What did the owl do? He woke up. I think the owl wasn't in the nest at first, but the owl came flying back when he saw a person near his nest. <laughs> Let's see what happens to Mr. Miller when the owl comes back and sees the Mr. Miller near his nest and see what the boys do about it when they're on the ground watching. Bruce and I ran to the other side of the tree so we could see up to the nest. Mr. Miller was hanging onto the tree with both arms and he was kicking out with his feet. It looked as if his feet had slipped out off the branch and couldn't find a place to get hold of again. Just then, there was a swooshing around and the old owl came diving right down right on top of him with her wings spread wide. She looked as big as a house and she didn't miss Mr. Miller by more than an inch. Then she swooped up and away again. Mr. Miller was yelling some strange things, and good and loud, too. He, <sighs> he finally got one foot back on a branch, but he was in such a hurry to get down 
that he picked too small a branch. It broke, and he slid about five feet before his belt caught on the stub. While he was trying to get loose, the owl came back for another try. This time she was so close that we could see her big yellow eyes, and both Bruce and I ducked. She had her claws struck way out in front of her. Just as she dived toward him, Mr. Miller, who couldn't see her coming because of his hat, gave a jump upward to get free of the stub. The result was that the owl couldn't miss him even if she wanted to. Then there was an awful flapping and yelling, and then away went the owl with Mr. Miller's hat. I don't think she really wanted that old hat. It was all Mr. Miller's fault for jumping at the wrong time. The owl seemed to be trying to shake the hat loose from her claws, but she couldn't because her claws were hooked in it. The last we saw of her, she was flying out over the prairie and she still had the hat. When Mr. Miller got down out of the tree, he went right to his haversack. He took out a bottle, opened it, and started to drink. His Adam's apple was going up and down as the bottle up and down like an accordion. After a while, he put down the bottle and wiped his mouth. When he saw us staring at him, he tried to smile. Cold tea, cold tea, he explained. Thirsty work climbing trees in this hot weather. It was an owl's nest, wasn't it, sir? asked Bruce. Mr. Miller looked at him hard for a moment. Yes, Bruce, he said. I guess it was. There was one thing about Mr. Miller. You couldn't stop him for long. Now he explained to us that it was probably a bad thing to climb up to the nest because it would disturb the owls too much. He had a better idea. He took a hatchet out of his haversack and we set to work building something he liked to call a blind. What this really was was a little tent fixed on a platform of sticks high up in another tree, but close to the owl tree. It took a couple of hours to build the blind. Bruce and I went scrounging for pieces of wood, and when we brought them back, Mr. Miller hauled them up to the chosen tree with a rope and nailed them into place. When he had a platform built, he hauled up the tent. Then the tent had a round hole, about as big as your fist, in the front of it. That was for the camera. According to Mr. Miller, you could hide in the blind and stay there until the owl thought everything was safe. Then, when the owl came back to her nest, you could take all the pictures you wanted and she would never even know about it. Mr. Mil Miller <laughs> he, sure, he sure must think owls are dumb. Bruce muttered to me when Mr. Miller wasn't near. She may not see him, but she could see that tent if her eyes were tight shut, and I don't think she's going to like it. When the blind was finished, Mr. Miller said he was ready to try it. You boys go off for a walk, he told us. Make a lot of noise when you're leaving. The books say birds can't count, so the owl will think all three of us have gone, and she'll never guess I've stayed up here in the blind. Okay, Mr. Miller, I said. Come on, Bruce, let's get walking. We walked about a mile away to a little slough. Do you remember what a slough is? It's a... It's what you call a pond or water. a lake when it's, yeah, water, when it's on the prairie in Canada. And started looking for red-winged blackbirds' nests. It was another nice day, and we forgot about Mr. Miller until we began to get hungry. Then we went back to the bluff. Mr. Miller was on the ground. He had just finished the rest of his cold tea, but he didn't look the least bit well. So something has happened while the boys were not there. His face was awfully white and his hands were shaking as he tried to put his camera away the camera looked as if it had fallen out of a tree. It was all scratched and covered with dirt. Get some good pictures, sir? I asked him cheerfully. No, I didn't, Mr. Miller said. And it was sort of a snarl. But I'll tell you one thing. Any blame fool who says owls can't count is a liar. 
What do you think happened to Mr. Miller while the boys were gone? Uh, the owl scratched him. Seems like it to me. Let's read and find out. On the way home, Mr. Miller finally told us what happened. About an hour after we went walking, the owl came back. She lit on her nest, and then she turned around and took a good long look at the little tent, which was on level with her, and only about six feet away. Mr. Miller was busy inside the tent, focusing his camera and getting ready to take the owl's picture. When she asked, Hoo, 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 and took one leap. The next thing Mr. Miller knew, the front was ripped right out of the tent, and the owl was looking him in the eye from about a foot away. Mr. Miller accidentally dropped his camera, and then, of course, he had to hurry down to see if it was all right, and that was when we, we got back to the bluff. I guess it wasn't a very good day for Mr. Miller, but it wasn't too bad for us. Mr. Miller said he had seen three young owls in the nest, and he thought they were about halfway grown, which meant they were about the right age to take home for pets. All we had to do now was figure out some way to get a hold of them. That is that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. No. Owls and the Family by Farley Moat, and that was chapter two. Hope you enjoyed reading chapter two, and I hope you heard the word scrounging as you were listening to chapter two, and the boys went scrounging for wood for Mr. Miller to make his blind. And I hope you'll come back and read chapter three of Owls in the Family with us.